Um, so thank you for joining us for today's call. In celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we are thrilled to be able to connect with all of you. We have some guardians, members, and supporters from all over the country taking part in today's call, which is always fun to see. And it's a true honor to be able to kick this call off. Um, celebrating Earth Day is a great way to um, connect with our fellow humans as we reflect on the critical protections that have been put in place over the last 50 years. And we look to the future and what is still needed to protect our planet, because we know there's a lot more that needs to be done and hasn't been done. And I imagine for many of us, we feel strongly that respecting the planet is our responsibility every day of the year, not just on Earth Day. But today does give us a chance to reflect on what we can all do better and how we can all inspire change. At Guardians, we know that both big actions and small actions are important, are important to truly have an impact. And I know for me, today is a day that I personally reflect on the planet that we'll leave behind to our next generation, specifically my own two daughters and how I can be a part of the solution to make things better. So that's my reflection today on Earth Day. So today's call will last an hour. We'll probably jump off just a little before um, the hour ends. And we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions, um, which you can type right into the chat box. You will hear from lots of wonderful Guardian staff today, including John Horning, Guardian's Ex Executive Director, Sarah McMillan, our Conservation Director, and Jeremy Nichols, our Climate and Energy Program Director. So thank you to all of you for joining us on the call, and thank you um, for the guests on the call for joining us uh, in celebration of Earth Day today. I'm going to pass it over to John, who is going to continue things on. Thank you, Lindsay. Great to see everyone out there. As Lindsay noted, uh, Guardians is scattered across the West, reflecting uh, the geography that we cover. And uh, as a way of introducing myself, I will tell you that I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I have lived for a little more than a quarter of a century. I've also worked for Guardians for 25 years and uh, dedicated, obviously, a big part of my life to to growing guardians into the force that it is today. And I'm lucky to have with me on the call two other guardians who play uh, longstanding um, major leadership roles in uh, guardians' influence and impact from where they live in the West. And so I'd like both Sarah and Jeremy for you to briefly introduce yourselves as well. Jeremy, you go. You're muted. There we go. All right. <laughs> Hooray for this new normal. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Nichols. I'm the Climate and Energy Program Director for Wild Earth Guardians, and I'm hunkered down in my home in Golden, Colorado right now, and excited to be here. Thanks, everybody, for showing up, and looking forward to talking more. And I am Sarah McMillan, the Conservation Director for Wild Earth Guardians. I'm in Missoula, Montana, where I've been almost forever. Um, and it is the Aboriginal homelands of the Salish and Kaputni people. And I live just at the base of Mount Jumbo. And I'm really glad to be here with you all today. Thank you. So thank you both. So I thought we'd start with um, really some Earth Day reflections. Um, it is a day, as I have been thinking about Earth Day, like any meaningful anniversary. Anniversaries are times for reflection and uh, ideally recommitment to core values. And so given that we're at the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and um, given that it's coming at such a momentous, challenging time where I think we're all reflecting more on how we share this one planet and how deeply interconnected we are because of, um, you know, just a deeper understanding that things that happen in a relatively small, um, isolated province of China now affecting the whole world and all of, of course, the environmental uh, and human health implications of the coronavirus, which we won't be going into today. Um, but I think it's worth reflecting. So I thought I'd just offer my brief reflections as a way of asking each of you to, to reflect on what it is you're thinking about. So 
I was four years old when, when Earth Day was founded, so I don't remember the first Earth Day, unlike some people that I, that I know. Um, and you know, what's interesting is I've been doing just over the last three or four days some reflections on or research into the historical, um, the origins of Earth Day and realizing it was a profound, momentous um, occasion. And I think growing up as a young environmentalist, I used to take Earth Day sort of for granted. We do the work every day. You try and live the values every day. And so I sort of think of like the hallmarkification of Earth Day and sort of thought about it cynically. But as I was, and just this morning, I actually saw a photo of people gathered in New York City and the throng, the masses, um, of, of people. Um, so it just made me realize that Earth Day 50 years ago was a, a profound turning point of mobilizing people and growing up. I think I took that for granted. And I, I share that reflection because let's hope this Earth Day, not only because it's 50, but it's occurring at a time of the climate crisis, the nature crisis, and this math, massive global health crisis will also be a turning point to deepen our commitment to do what's necessary to solve these interrelated problems. Um, so with, with that as my reflection, I'd love to hear your reflections, Jeremy and Sarah, about just how you've related to Earth Day uh, when you were younger growing up and as you came into the environmental movement and how you're viewing that through the lens of these times and the 50th anniversary of it. You want me to go first, Sarah? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, you know, because um, it just always has seemed a part of kind of the, my fabric of existence. It's just always seemed like something that we acknowledged and we celebrated to some degree, but I don't want to pull out the old cliche, but I will. Um, I think from my standpoint, every day is Earth Day, of course, but, but that's, you know, that is a cliche. And that's not entirely true because on a day like today, especially in the midst of a, an unprecedented, fairly unprecedented global health pandemic, um, you know, it definitely takes on new meaning and new appreciation just in terms of like, wow, uh, this planet is so out of whack right now and we're, we've been working hard to try to fix that but obviously we need to to step it up even more and to embrace new tools and new empower um, new allies new friends new communities um, it's it's to me what it means to me right now you know it's interesting i grew up in the american west i grew up in idaho and to me the environment and public lands have always been kind of one and the same and something I've valued tremendously. But as I've been doing this work more as the climate energy program director, and especially in this, in this day of age right now that we're in this unprecedented crisis, it's made me realize, you know, the environmental movement is, it is so much more than public lands. They're certainly vital and integral to, you know, protecting our planet, protecting our health and well-being. but um, there's so much more involved and intertwined with public lands. And, you know, what I'm seeing is, you know, like environmental justice and, um, and justice for indigenous communities and indigenous peoples and social justice um, just intersecting so vividly with this crisis that we're in. And, and the climate crisis is, is equally a part of that. And so to me, it's, it's just, it's been a bit reassuring, but also empowering to realize that justice is core to all this. Um, that public land, whether you're talking public lands, waters, wildlife, it's it's all goes back to justice and making sure everyone and everything is treated fairly and with respect. And that's what we're after here. So um, it's a it's a bit disorienting right now. I'll acknowledge. And there was actually a Denver Westward article that uh, I was featured in that came out uh, yesterday, and it, it highlighted how the environmental movement in Colorado, in particular, is. A bit off balance right now because of the crisis. We're not able to engage in the same way we used to, but but we're embracing the opportunities we have and the new tools that we have, like like showing up on Zoom to still advocate for change uh, before government agencies. And um, there's there's a lot of reason to be hopeful even amid um, even amid the disorientation. And so we're we're staying committed. We're staying focused. Um, so anyway, that's my reflection there. Sarah, how about you? Yeah, I would say that um, 
I similarly sort of grew up in the environmental movement marching on the shoulders of my mother um, in anti-nuke rallies and things like that. Um, so it's been part of the fabric of my life. Um, I think as you have, the two of you have noted, we're in a different era right now. And um, the, the vulnerabilities that our communities, human communities are experiencing um, feels reflective of some of the risk and vulnerability that we're seeing in the in the planet. Um, and I think for me, my work is to protect the earth, but I'm committing to um, kind of like, <laughs> this is kind of like a marriage. Like you might commit to work on it and protect it and make it better, but you also really have to appreciate it and love the other person. And so my commitment is actually to getting out and appreciating and loving and not spending all of my time on the computer trying to protect it and keep it going. So that's, um, <laughs> that's probably a goofy analogy, but there no, you I go. Love that. <laughs> I love that. And I love both reflections that, that Earth Day fundamentally is about justice and equity for, for all living things. And it has to be viewed through that lens. And then the lens of, of, of love and deep appreciation, because you can't, um, you can't shift and, and, and do things differently unless it's from a place of, of deep love. And there's anger too, but anger comes from what you love being threatened. So thank you both for those reflections. Um, obviously, when the, when the founders of Earth Day launched it, they did so with a belief that our relationship to the earth needed to fundamentally change. Uh, and in many ways, that vision has been quite successful. Things like DDT have been banned. Things like um, the Endangered Species Act came to pass and we've restored wolves. And there's so many ways in which we are mindful of, of the imbalance in our relationship and we've gotten things right. And yet so many challenges that still lie ahead of us and so many things that, that sadly have worsened over the last 50 years. Um, we sort of said, hey, let's take inspiration from those founders and use this 50th anniversary as a means of recommitting to a bold vision. And so we've launched this Earth Day Pledge, which includes nine kind of key components to it. And we really wanted to focus our discussion today on one of them. Um, and that one is really ending extraction on the public lands that all citizens, all people that live in the United States can enjoy. And the threats to those public lands are many and varied, but in this day and age, we believe that the biggest threat is unquestionably the fossil fuel industry. We're gonna talk, before I get into that, I just wanna make reference to this being a series of webinars, and we're gonna use Every two weeks, um, we'll be talking about both what's relevant and current in the, in the news, in Guardian's advocacy, and in this Earth Day manifesto. So in two weeks, we're going to be talking about our um, efforts to systemically protect wild nature across the American West. Two or four weeks after that, we're going to be, going to be talking about uh, the manifesto's platform calling for the reactivation of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, for those of you who don't know, of course, the Civilian Conservation Corps was a, a cornerstone of the Great Depression uh, works projects that the government engaged in. And uh, to me, that's just one other reflection that I wanted to offer before we dig into the heart of our discussion is I think this Earth Day, both because of the severity of the, of the crisis and because of the, um, the specific context of the global pandemic, really offer an opportunity for the government and our, the citizens to really demand more. And I think we've, if you think about three months ago, people were talking about the Green New Deal and saying, well, it's going to cost trillions. There's no way the government will ever, will ever do that. And now the government has done that, not once, but twice, and may, may again spend 
you know, hundreds of billions and or trillions of dollars to address uh, a, a major problem. So our job as citizens is to get the government used to exercising those big muscles to, to use martial federal resources to solve big problems. So um, stay tuned. We'll be having other staff back in future weeks. So with that, I, I wanted to really, um, again, hone in on the conversation around our efforts to address the climate crisis and protect public lands. So you got the nexus of fossil fuels, public lands, and climate by um, bringing an end to, to extraction on public lands. And I wanted to start just by sharing a reflection and um, getting your thoughts on this, Jeremy. So I was looking through Paul Hawkins' book, Draw Down, recently, and I wanted to just, you know, just part of reflecting on this momentous occasion. And I thought for sure in the, uh, Draw Down is about how we essentially address the climate crisis. And in it, um, there are many examples of things we can be doing to draw down our economy and create a more restorative and regenerative economy. And there is no mention in the book Draw Down of the need to address supply side climate policy. And I'm curious just to hear your perspective uh, about why keeping fossil fuels in the ground and supply side might have been overlooked by Paul Hawken. And yeah, what's your insight is to that and then launch into the work itself. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of intuitive when you think about it. Um, you know, keeping fossil fuels in the ground obviously keeps them from being consumed, which is the source of the greenhouse gas emissions fueling our climate prices. But the common refrain I get in response to that, that intuitive assessment and conclusion is that, well, you know, Jeremy, if they don't mine coal in Wyoming, they're just going to mine it somewhere else. And or if they don't frack Colorado, then they're just going to frack somewhere else. The oil and gas is going to come from somewhere else. And it's such a short sighted and simplistic uh, assessment of the ability of our movement to make change. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's some truth to that. But it's overshadowed by the fact that if we don't start setting the policies that send the signals to the markets and to the fossil fuel companies that their days are numbered, then it's going to be easier for them to persist. They're going to be able to continue to produce and to force us to have to consume fossil fuels for a longer period of time. Uh, and in some cases, it is flat out false because like the example I gave about coal mining in Wyoming, that's the Powder River Basin, uh, which is the largest coal producing region in the country. And there's just from a practical standpoint, no other coal producing region could produce anywhere near the amount of coal in that, in that area. So um, there is a very real impact if you start winding down coal production in the Powder River Basin. It, it will have a, an, an actual, like it will limit the amount of supply that's available. Oil and gas is certainly a little more complicated, but still it's got to start somewhere. And we're working really hard right now to get uh, the state of Colorado to, and, and New Mexico to some degree as well, to start to acknowledge the fact that we need to start reining in production uh, from a, a practical climate standpoint that, that you know, if we're going to walk the walk and, and talk the talk, then we need to say we can't have a future that involves fossil fuel production. And not necessarily with the aim of, you know, reducing overall supply, because as we're seeing right now, so oil and gas supply is an, um, it's a global phenomenon, and it doesn't just hinge on whether or not oil and gas is produced in Colorado. But getting state governments like Colorado, uh, maybe even local governments, and maybe regional, uh, regional governments to uh, step up and say, you know what, we can't frack our way to a safe climate. Uh, it starts to send the message that this is for real, this is a, a valuable and important part of our overall uh, response to the climate crisis. And, you know, it, it's not at the expense of the demand side, you know, we need to electrify our transportation system, we need to electrify buildings, we need to, to help our collective society move beyond fossil fuels, but it needs to be a both end approach, it needs to be the production end and the consumption end. Uh, to have a complete response, complete and effective and robust response to the climate crisis. And that's really what we're after here. And it's a role that Guardians plays um, throughout the American West, trying to get the demand side on the radar of the policymakers and to uh, enact some effective um, change that, that does say to the coal and the oil and gas companies that your days are numbered and you, you, better, you better come up with an end game right now. Yeah. You know, in terms of the, the days being numbered, 
I thought it'd be good to talk a little bit more about coal and then get into oil and gas, given the demise of coal. Um, and, you know, it was just looking at some numbers and reflecting on, you mentioned the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and Sarah's home state of Montana. Yeah. Um, you know, a decade ago, we were mining something like a half a million tons of coal. Now it's down somewhere in the neighborhood of under 300 million tons of coal. It's still a massive amount of, <laughs> of coal that's coming from public lands. Um, I, I wonder um, what, how, how, how you would describe where we are in the effort to wean ourselves from the coal that underlies America's public lands in the broader trajectory uh, looking over the last, you know, 20 years and, and looking ahead to the next 10. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, uh, I, I would have to say first, you know, rumors of the coal industry's death are grossly exaggerated at this moment. Um, certainly they're weakened and they're wounded and um, they're, you know, they're economically uh, collapsing, but they're nowhere near out of the picture. There's still a lot of coal produced. And as John mentioned, as you mentioned, John, um, you know, more than 40% of the coal produced in the United States comes from public lands, mostly in the American West. Uh, either through massive strip mines in the Powder River Basin of Northeast Wyoming and Southeast Montana, or from several underground mines in Colorado, Utah, and even New Mexico. Um, that, that carbon uh, is linked to around 15% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's say, that, say that again. Around 15% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are linked to coal produced in, from public lands, mostly in the American West. Now that number is going down, but that's still a huge contributor. And I think a lot, you know, a lot of people may be surprised to hear that our nation still consumes a lot of coal. It's gone down considerably for sure. It's around a quarter of our overall generating portfolio, um, but it still exists. And you know, pound per pound, burning coal is the most carbon intensive source of fuel in, this, in our world. Um, so every ton of coal we're burning is releasing a massive amount of carbon pollution. And so we really, we do need to stay focused on continuing, making sure the trend, the coal industry's trend continues. And that trend is to ultimate demise. Um, we need to be, you know, keeping coal in the ground and ultimately putting the coal industry fully out of business so that we can fully transition uh, to 100% renewable energy. So that's, it's really important work that we're still doing and we're actually still on the front lines. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Sarah's state of Montana. We're actually in court right now challenging an expansion of a massive mine uh, called the Spring Creek Coal Mine in Southeast Montana. And, um, you know, these companies, they're still at it. They're still at it. And uh, even though the Trump administration hasn't been able to totally bail out the coal industry, um, they've definitely done some favors for them that, uh, that unfortunately, could extend their life uh, even further if we don't uh, if we don't continue to maintain the pressure. So yeah. it's still still part, you know core to our work at the Climate and Energy Program. Yeah, I'm curious, Sarah, how we've been talking at times about how the moral and ethical narrative of divestment is relevant in in the context of public ownership, and just to hear if you have reflections about the parallels between divestment from, um, say, a church or schools, ownership of fossil fuels, and how that was relevant to the public lands that all Americans share ownership in. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Curveball. <laughs> Uh, well, I think about ownership and I think about how the public lands belong to us, but they're being essentially um, occupied by coal and oil and gas industry so that the lands that belong to the public are no longer really available to the public. Um, and so in some ways, that's also a, like the, the federal government divesting us of our ownership and I know that isn't quite what you were aiming for but that's sort of where my mind went around um, so I'm not sure what you were getting at John yeah well I think it's basically um, uh, the idea that we all own it and therefore in the same way that people of faith or people 
young students who are responding to the moral imperative of wanting to align their own values with the decisions of the institutions they attend or the communities with whom they worship. I think all Americans have that same moral imperative uh, to align our values of wanting to solve the climate crisis by saying, hey, we own this coal. We bear moral responsibility for its, its burning. So um, uh, that's, that's, that's the essence. I've always thought that the, the imperative of divestment is quite relevant to the imperative of, of locking down the fossil fuels that underlie public lands. Yeah, that's always been so important too, John. Sorry, Sarah, just real quick. I mean, the, the fact that these are public lands, we say public lands and that, that is literal, that they, they are owned by every American, these lands, these federally managed public lands in the American West. So every, whether you live in Maine or Southern California, you have a role to play and, and a responsibility to take in many respects. And we're trying to help people understand that so that they can say to the Department of the Interior, which manages most of these lands and minerals, uh, that they also need, they need to get out of the fossil fuel business. It's, it's time for them to, uh, you know, it's time for them to make the divestment happen and to, um, to respond to the Americans, uh, you know, the American imperative to uh, confront the climate crisis and to move to more sustainable and prosperous economies. How are we going to do that? I mean, go ahead, Sarah. Well, I was just thinking that the, the context we find ourselves in with the um, coronavirus pandemic has actually I think provided some highlights around we, we actually do have the power to make dramatic changes if we all come together to stop flying. All of a sudden there is an incredible decrease in the use of oil and gas in the air pollution that's happening and waters are clear, clear and all of these things are happening when they're, they're sort of side effects right now of the pandemic and actions that people are taking. But if we put our minds to it, we as, as a world and as the United States, um, we can make really significant changes. So while it might seem huge, like 10 years ago, the idea of really taking down the coal industry might have seemed impossible. And then a few years ago, before the most recent presidential election, it felt more like we were really, it was really happening. And as Jeremy said, they are, the industry is injured. But my, my point is that tremendous change can happen when we put our minds to it. And we're seeing that in a lot of ways um, in this current context. Absolutely. And I, I actually want to remind our, our listeners, attendees today, that one of the things, one of the main things we're asking our members and e-activists to do today is to sign our Earth Day pledge to call on leaders to make these profound shifts that Sarah just noted. And one of those profound shifts is to bring an end to the federal coal program. As a sort of slow segue to the work of the oil and gas program, I'm wondering, Jamie, if you can harken back to the end of the Obama administration and give people insight into sort of the roadmap that we took a detour on with the Trump administration, but the roadmap that the Obama administration was laying out to bring that just and swift end to, to the coal program, because it's, it's obviously relevant to the future and it's obviously relevant also to the federal oil and gas program as well. Oh, hearkening back to the good old days. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's almost hard to believe they even happened. Um, so yeah, well, I mean- A lot of struggle leading up to to those good old days. They weren't all good under the Obama no. administration, as you well know. No, it was, uh, it was shocking. And you know, from the day the Obama administration took office, it was, uh, it, was, it was shocking how much they facilitated more fossil fuel extraction, uh, particularly from public lands. And um, not only were they leasing massive amounts of coal, probably more coal than any other federal administration has ever leased before, ever sold to private companies to extract, uh, but they they opened the floodgates for more the the sale of public lands for fracking and uh, oil and gas leasing, basically handing over the rights to oil and gas companies to develop those lands. And you know we started focusing on the coal program, the federal coal management program, because as I mentioned earlier, it's it has such a massive climate footprint and and really like we we got to start with the most carbon intensive source of greenhouse gas emissions, which is coal combustion. 
So we started on that, but as we were as we were working, we we slowly developed and, and cultivated this uh, campaign to confront oil and gas extraction on public lands. And if anybody's traveled around in the Rocky Mountain West, what, you know, Southeast Montana, Wyoming, Western Colorado, um, you've probably seen oil and gas extraction activities on public lands, whether in the form of drilling rigs or producing wells, truck traffic, um, uh, lots of industrial activity, unfortunately, happening in, uh, in many places in the American West. So we, uh, we put together a campaign and, and built a, a coalition of, of a lot of other partner groups and allies. And uh, we launched with an ask that the Obama administration uh, stop leasing public lands for fracking, basically put the brakes on leasing, issue a moratorium and create space and an opportunity to reform the federal oil and gas program to be come consistent with our climate objectives. And that essentially amounted to how do we manage uh, a decline of the industry and, and manage uh, an ultimate phase out of the oil and gas industry. And um, we, we faced a lot of resistance, uh, but we, in the end of the Obama administration, we were showing up in big ways. We, we filed a big lawsuit challenging hundreds of thousands of acres of oil and gas leasing in the American West on climate grounds. We were showing up to protest and to call for climate action. And we were just a lot of good energy and a lot of good momentum was building. We were feeling really good about it. Um, and, then, uh, and then the nightmare set in. Um, and, but uh, <laughs> I don't we're still maintaining that momentum. I, I mean, I have to admit, and we, we are pushing back harder than ever against the Trump administration because we, we can't afford not to. Um, if we're going to allow, it's, it's a concept called carbon lock-in. And you and I have talked about this a bit, John, but it's basically this concept that if you lease public lands for oil and gas development, you hand over the rights to develop, that you are, you are preventing opportunities or, or foregoing opportunities to prevent the development of those fossil fuels and the ultimate consumption of those fossil fuels. And by locking that carbon in through an oil and gas lease, um, you, are, you are slowing our ability to transition away from fossil fuels and you're encouraging more consumption in, in doing that. So we're staying focused on that oil and gas leasing stage where we're hearkening back to the momentum we built under the Obama administration and hopefully we'll be able to pick that back up uh, in earnest and have a chance of actually achieving some significant policy shifts. But, uh, but that's been the aim from you know, day one in terms of our, our work to confront fossil fuel production here in the American West. Yeah, and I, I'm just thinking the, the lock-in idea. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of acres that have been leased that are not being developed, but they're already locked in. So there are already, there's a massive backlog already of public lands that have been committed to fossil fuel development. Already. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's been the shocking thing uh, under the Trump administration. They have pushed to lease an unprecedented amount of acreage in the American West to the oil and gas industry. But at the same time, less than half of the leased acres right now are actually producing oil and gas. So there's zero need to lease. Like there is no energy need. There's no energy independence need. It's all political right now. And it just, it makes it even more egregious and more, that's something that just warrants a more aggressive response from, from our end. Yeah. Well, this is, this is where the climate and the nature crisis meet the privatization mm. uh, push of, of private industries. So I, I want to take a step back briefly to give uh, our, our participants here a little more context on the oil and gas program and have you, Jeremy and Sarah, talk more about it. But when I, from my view, think about the oil and gas work and the effort to, to bring a just and swift end to the extraction of oil and gas from public lands, I sort of think about it, you tell me if I get this uh, right, sort of there's the climate lens, of course. It is about the climate. That's the overarching lens. The poster child for that's the Permian Basin. Then there's this clean air lens, communities across the West that are being harmed by localized fossil fuel driven clean air problems with Denver in the front range mm -hmm. being a major push. And then there's this uh, community, uh, sacred land, indigenous community lens. And I think of our Chaco push as being the best example of, of that approach to the oil and gas program. I'm wondering if, if um, you and Sarah might talk about that strategic framework and how those pieces 
both work independently and interdependently to drive this outcome of bringing a, a swift and just end to the extraction of oil and gas on public lands. And I wonder, Jeremy, if you could just provide a, like a brief, what, what's going on in the Permian Basin? If I think that might be helpful to give that context to folks too, if yeah, that's where sure. we're gonna start. Yeah, so just real quick, the Permian Basin, it's in West Texas and Southeast New Mexico, and it's the most productive oil producing region in the world right now. Um, it actually beats out Saudi Arabia, uh, although maybe not at the moment, given the collapse of the industry. But uh, huge amounts of fossil fuels being produced. And the New Mexico portion of the Permian Basin uh, is mostly, or around a third, uh, public lands. So lands managed, actually, I should say two thirds public lands, because a third, a third is federal, federally managed public lands, and the other, and another third is uh, state managed public lands. So again, there's a role for people to play in terms of saying, "Hey, wait a minute, we uh, we own those lands, and we want them managed differently. We want them managed in a way that's um, more cognizant of our climate crisis." But what's happening in the in the Permian and elsewhere in the American West is we're seeing um, tremendous health consequences associated with oil and gas extraction. And it's manifesting in the form of unhealthy air pollution, uh, toxins and poisons being released, and, um, and also in the form of, uh, of water contamination, lots of spills and, um, and instances where the industry is, uh, is polluting uh, rivers and streams and even drinking water supplies. You know, it's important to highlight how oil and gas extraction, yes, it matters, like you said, John, the climate, Climate is paramount. But when we actually go a little more deeply to understand what's happening, we see that there are tremendous costs associated with fossil fuel extraction on so many different fronts, whether it's the cost of air pollution, the cost of being exposed to benzene, the cost of diminished clean water, the cost of um, you know, truck traffic even, uh, impacting communities like in the greater Chaco region. Um, Degradation of wildlife habitat and yeah. so many, yeah. So a lot of what we do is we try to um, ensure that the industry is, is bearing those costs, that they're not foisting those costs onto our shoulders. And uh, we think that's really important because right now the oil and gas industry doesn't have to bear the expense of the external impacts of its uh, development. And that, that's been just key uh, for a lot of groups, not just guardians, but a lot of groups. We're trying to expose the true cost of fossil fuels because we know that they've not only been given direct subsidies in many respects, as, as we've heard, but also all these like indirect subsidies. Like they're not the ones that pay hospital bills. They're not the ones that pay to clean up massive amounts of water and air pollution. I wanna highlight air pollution just real quick, just to kind of put it into context, what we're talking about here and bring it back to the Permian. Uh, because of the boom in fracking in that region, their levels of smog, which is uh, also called ground level ozone, and ozone actually up high, it's really bad, it's really good for the planet, uh, but down low, it's a poisonous gas. Usually we see high ozone in big cities, Houston, LA, New York. Um, the Permian Basin though, in Southeast New Mexico has experienced ozone levels, smog levels, higher than Los Angeles and Houston. You're and in fact, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And there is no other source of air pollution in that region capable of creating that kind of mess other than the oil and gas industry. But it's not just there. We see the oil and gas industry fueling smog pollution in Northeast Utah, in the Uinta Basin, in Western Wyoming, in the Upper Green River Basin, and in other parts of the American West. And it surprises people to hear that even in the Denver metro area, the big city, that the oil and gas industry is actually the biggest contributor to the region's ozone problem. Uh, we do have high ozone in the Denver area. It sometimes is on par with Los Angeles. And every time they go back to assess it, they find that the oil and gas industry is the most significant culprit. It's not that cars and trucks don't contribute, but the oil and gas is the biggest contributor. So it really is, it's, it just exposes how, like for, a climate, for climate purposes, we have to get at oil and gas, but we gotta get off oil and gas just to, to protect our clean air, protect our health, and to, to have um, you know, that brighter future that we want. I think that's I, a really good point to make, Jeremy, that, that obviously fossil fuel um, is having a massive impact on our the climate issues, but it also has a big impact on the ground in specific regions, whether you know whether that's air pollution or water pollution or habitat pollution. I mean, not pollution, but habitat impact. So that it has both a climate impact and and on the ground on human beings and communities as well as um, 
wildlife and habitat impacts. Yeah. And so it's, that's, that's where the climate work really kind of weaves into all of the work we do across the entire organization. Just reflecting on the clean air piece and the risk uh, due to exposure to, to poor air quality. I think we've, most of uh, our, our listeners, participants know that there's a direct tie between a greater likelihood of death due to COVID-19 in regions of poor air quality. So the consequences are, are quite grave and, and profound for people exposed to, to bad air quality. I, I'm curious, Jeremy, to hear how, you know, sometimes climate is, it's too distant, doesn't affect us now, how the lens of uh, the greater urgency around clean air, how that is maybe resonating or not and or mobilizing different audiences, especially on the front range of Colorado, mm -hmm. that uh, again, link back to the, the need to lock down fossil fuels. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the clean air uh, aspect uh, of, of our work, I mean, it's, it's a way to engage people uh, who are feeling it directly. You know, people here in the Denver metro area along the Colorado front range dealing with high ozone levels man, they feel it and everybody knows it, everybody hears about it. Every time there's a high ozone alert or high smog alert, um, it's news, it's news. Families know about it because there's families with kids with asthma, there's you know, adults with asthma, there's people with uh, respiratory uh, problems that are made worse by our high ozone. And so it's a, it's a way to, um, to enlist and empower folks who, who get clean air and who want clean air or need clean air to get them more engaged in this, uh, this fight to help us transition away from fossil fuels. And, and it's a way to help people see that bigger picture. I mean, first they see the clean air and then they start to see, oh yeah, and the climate um, dimension here, that matters too, and that's important. Um, and you know, it, it is kind of coming into focus for a lot of people with the coronavirus uh, health crisis right now and the, the revelations that air pollution actually makes people more vulnerable. We've actually been working with a lot of groups to call on uh, the state of Colorado and also the federal government, the Trump administration, to stop uh, selling more public lands for fracking and start, stop approving more drilling permits and to even put the brakes on fossil fuel production uh, in this moment of crisis. And uh, people get it, people get yeah. it. And they're really showing up to rally for that kind of change. I love Jared Polis. I love your governor. I think he's handled uh, the COVID crisis with tremendous uh, dignity and humility and clarity. Uh, so I'm a big fan. How has he responded to those requests and well, or his administration? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, we're still working at it. And, and, you know, I'll give him credit. I mean, he's trying to make sure there's enough hospital beds and enough ventilators and enough equipment to prepare for, um, for what could come. So, you know, I want to acknowledge that, but at the same time, he's, he's not been responsive to the need to also uh, put the brakes on fossil fuel production and help rein in our air pollution problem in this, in this time of crisis. Now, thankfully, the oil and gas industry is, um, it, it, folks might have heard, they're not doing too well economically. And we're already hearing that uh, a lot of companies are scaling back production considerably right now, which, I mean, I don't want to rest our, our climate success and clean air success on the markets, but right now they're working to our favor. Yep. It's funny. I was going to ask that question. Go ahead, Sarah. Well, I actually just wanted to help Lindsay here and say we have like eight minutes left or nine minutes yeah. left because oh, yeah. we're actually trying to stop a little early because yeah. Jeremy then goes on into his uh, climate and energy Facebook live event immediately after this. We want to give him two minutes to get a drink of water. So I just wanted to sort of reevaluate our schedule. We haven't gotten through everything. Big surprise with three talkers here. Um, but well, these, are big, these are big topics. We could very we could go big. for a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, here's what I want to do. I want to urge again our, our um, participants to sign our Earth Day pledge. It's one thing you can do. I hope you're all reflecting on other things you can do to deepen your commitment as individuals, as Guardians members, as, um, again, individuals who, who understand that we face deep challenges and with, with all of us acting in, a, in an aligned way as we are under this COVID pandemic, um, we, we, so we're exercising muscles that we haven't exercised in a while and it's a beautiful thing i know myself like i've i've reflected about my ethical obligation to care for 
health from a communal perspective, not just from my own perspective. So let's keep exercising those muscles. Um, and again, sign our pledge, know that we'll be coming back to uh, these same issues that are a part of our, our Earth Day manifesto um, over the coming weeks when we do these calls. Do we wanna try and get any questions in the last five or six minutes? Uh, if not, I have a quest one more question for the two of you. Well, I wouldn't mind, so Lindsay, I don't mean to be cutting you off, sorry. I'm happy to do questions and or, it might be interesting to close also on the work we're doing in Chaco for a couple of minutes at least, but. Um, well, how about if anyone has any pressing questions, I can just put them in the chat box and we'll see if we, what we have time for. But um, in the meantime, I, I think that's a great idea, Sarah. Are you, are you too okay with that, John? Or do you wanna move that on to the question? Great. No, that sounds great. Let's, uh, why don't you each reflect on the importance of our Greater Chaco campaign, both as an end in itself, why is it important, what's at stake, and also how it's relevant to the broader fight of creating the political will and the, the social will to bring an end to the federal oil and gas program as expeditiously as possible. Yeah, um, I would, I guess I would start by just saying that these industries are incredibly powerful. Um, they have the ear of the current administration or the ears of the people in the current administration. Um, and it is going to require that we build the biggest possible tent to include as many people in this work. And um, some of the people who have the closest, deepest, deepest connections to the lands where they are, are indigenous peoples in this in, this, in the in the West, in all of the country, but in the West, and um, and we we have worked, and we do work with indigenous peoples in our uh, Bears Ears National Monument litigation and our grizzly bear work, and I think really importantly here, also I guess the in coal fired power plant work we've had we've had opportunities to work and develop relationships with, and I think um, Jeremy can talk to. The work we're doing specifically in Chaco. Yeah, I mean, just just real quick, because I, I know we're running short on time, but the Greater Chaco region of Northwest New Mexico will actually technically spans a lot of the Four Corner states. Uh, we, when you actually look at where the Chacoan civilization was, this is a, you know, about a thousand year old um, uh, society that we say ancestral Puebloans, but at the same time, Pueblos still exist. So it's not really like ancestral. It's just it, that's where the Pueblos. Pueblo and people were at the time a thousand years ago in the greater Chaco region. And they left quite a footprint as anybody who's visited that region knows. Uh, the runes that they left, the masonry that they developed, it still stands in many cases today. Uh, it's a testament to just, um, you know, uh, a testament to how amazing they were and how incredibly culturally um, advanced and evolved uh, they were. And, you know, we want to protect that region because not only is it important culturally for indigenous peoples and also uh, for people in the Americas. Uh, but it's also the home of the Navajo people today. Um, and it's their, it's their, it's their communities. Um, they live there. And the, unfortunately, what's happened is there's been a surge of fracking. The, here's the story played in, playing out all over again. Uh, the oil and gas industry starts fracking. There's a boom. And sure enough, they start encroaching upon Navajo communities and inching closer and closer to uh, these Chacoan runes. And so what we've done is we've tried to help, uh, well, we've tried to work together with partners to empower um, a, a diverse array of allies, including um, you know, Navajo residents, um, Pueblo allies, uh, other conservation organizations, cultural organizations to um, mount uh, a defensive effort to try to protect the region and try to advance kind of a new vision for public lands management, because uh, most of the fracking in the area, what has been approved by the Bureau of Land Management, they're the ones managing most of the lands. And, and we're trying to both uh, confront the crisis, but also pivot to creating an opportunity to, um, to revision public lands management, to be more inclusive uh, of indigenous communities and indigenous peoples, and to be more equitable. Uh, so we're, we're in the throes of that, and we could, we could go on for a while about that, but that's, that's a short of it. And, and Guardians is in, in the mix. Um, you know, we're not coming in and we're not being the saviors of the indigenous communities. That's not what this is about. It's about sharing resources and insight and information and trying to help 
respond to the impacts of unchecked oil and gas development, however it may manifest, whether it's in terms of road destruction by big trucks or air, local air pollution or you know, even um, you know, economic inequities and trying to match our skills and expertise to, to help advance change and progress um, uh, on many different fronts. Yeah, I mean, my sense, our Chaco campaign reflects a, a core guardian's belief that we must work with all kinds of peoples from all kinds of communities all across the American West and all across the country to build a movement um, that demands the kind of leadership for new models, new paradigms. And absent that movement, we're just not going to be successful. And I think in many ways, it's a good closing point because it's it was core to the belief of the Earth Day founders that they, they had to create a mass movement to demand leadership, to drive um, our political leaders to do uncomfortable things. That's what we need to do today um, is make our leaders uncomfortable because yeah. comfortable uh, is complacent and we can't be complacent in a time where we're facing all these crises. So with that, um, Unless, Lindsay, are there any uh, questions or additional thoughts from you? Um, yeah, we didn't have any questions come in through the chat box. So I think in the interest of time, we'll wrap up. But thank you, John, Jeremy, and Sarah for all of your thoughts today. Happy Earth Day to uh, everyone listening on the call. And thanks for those that participated or listened later on. But um, thanks for taking part in this call today. Yeah, happy right. Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Yes. Adios.